and welcome to this edition of EMS Now Up Close. I am Eric Miskell with EMS Now. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing uh, Timon Ruban. He is the founding and managing direct, a founder, excuse me, and managing director of Luminovo. Um, people who've seen, watched this show before know that I've spoken with uh, Sebastian Schall, who's the other co-founder of, of Luminovo. But Sebastian always said that Timon was the smart one. So we thought we better get him on here and, and get an interview with him. Uh, so Timon, thank you for agreeing to do this. I've been looking forward to interviewing you for a while. Why don't you begin by introducing yourself to the audience and what your role at Luminovo is? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Eric. Uh, glad to be on the show. And I'll need to make sure to come up with some kind words for Zeba as well. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but my name is Timon. Um, I started the company uh, together with Sebastian. Um, my role at Luminovo is leading all the product engineering. So I guess when Seba says I'm the smart one, he really just means I'm I'm the nerd. Um, <laughs> and I basically we have four product teams at Luminovo um, across the different domains, and I keep the strings together. Um, I studied electrical engineering uh, in another life, first in Zurich, then at Stanford. Um, and at Stanford in the US, that's actually where I met Seba. And then we both came back to Munich um, and thought we all need to do um, something with our lives um, uh, and decided to, to start a company together, which uh, was first, and you might know this a little bit about the history of Luminovo, an AI consulting company for the first two years, mostly computer vision, natural language processing. And then around at this point, also three years ago, um, we wanted to do a product, looked around a little bit, and because both me and Sebastian were electrical engineers by training, we ended up in the electronics industry. And uh, I think that's one of the best decisions we've made uh, kind of in our journey together to the state. Yeah. yeah, it seems to have worked out for you. So congratulations. The uh, one, you know, I know where, where you began, and, but I also know that the scope of the services and, and, and the customer base that you serve is has grown since the beginning. Why don't you tell us about kind of overview that full suite of services. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I just tell you a little bit about the history of kind of what we started with and then what we added and kind of this is kind of how it grew over time that now we're actually offering services um, to many stakeholders in the whole electronic supply chain. Um, so we started out early on being really focused on material costing for the bomb, basically, of which today also there's, there's multiple tools There had been at the time already, but many of the EMS we talked to back in the day around Munich and Germany, um, we saw a lot of like Excel and email based processes around people yeah. pulling up bombs from customers, opening a hundred tabs, getting all the prices from DigiKey and Fresnel and the different distributors. And we thought, well, that doesn't seem right. Um, and, and started with a product that basically where you can import a bomb and, and pull in all the different prices and availabilities from the different distributors. Um, and from this, we kind of step by step um, rolled out. And that was our vision from the beginning when we started with this bomb thing. That was kind of the first step. But we always thought we really want to be this co-pilot for the entire electronics supply chain. So what our tool does today is and I'll get to the different stakeholders maybe, mm -hmm. is given the design of an electronic product, and a big part of that is the bomb still, yeah. but it's also the PCB, the printed circuit board, and its design, um, and all the documentation you might need to actually assemble it later on. So given this design of an entire electronic product, um, answering all supply chain questions that might come up, how much will this cost? Can I manufacture it? Can I still manufacture it next year? And we kind of over time, step by step, expanded our offering that by now we're actually, um, I would say, pretty close. And you're never done um, with being able to answer most of these questions. And so how much will it cost? It's not just the bomb, but we've also invested a lot of time and effort um, around the printed circuit board, um, being able to read Gerber files, <laughs> automatically extract um, the price relevant parameters of a printed circuit board, as well as the kind of manufacturing DFM related um, parameters and getting a price for the PCB. And then kind of the last part in that step is the assembly itself, so the actual manufacturing costing and being able to go from, which are probably the most complex Excel sheets I've seen to this date, which are from some EMS there, manufacturing costing Excel sheet <laughs> and kind of mapping that into our software so that you can more automatically um, yeah, upload a whole design, the bomb, 
mm -hmm. the, the Google files and, and be able to answer that question about costs, also availability, because as, as I said, we, we started with that, are all the parts available right now, but also other things about like compliance and life cycle. I talked <laughs> about, can I manufacture it next year? So is it actually, what's the life cycle of my entire bomb on one click and being able to get yeah, all of these supply chain insights very tailored towards mm -hmm. the processes in the electronics industry into one mm -hmm. product. Okay. Yeah, and I did like that. I saw, I think you on your website, it shows for the EMS, the, uh, the OEM, and also the PCB. And there seems to be, you know, some of the services vary between it, although I said EMS, OEM was very similar, PCB obviously being a bit different, right? So it, it, it's a little bit different there. But so I like that it's linking the whole ecosystem these days, right? Because I think that's a big movement within the industry. And, you know, you know, for, 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 for a manufacturer on the other side, it's be good to have a solution that incorporates all of these, I think. So is, is there really kind of a core service within that that you focus? Or is it just depending on who you are, the type of company? Yeah, so I mean, the thing that we realized early on is when, so when it comes to offering solutions to different stakeholders, industry designers, PCB suppliers, and EMS. Um, our, our, we realized early on that the problems that they're solving or like the questions that they ask themselves and need to answer, how much is it going to cost? Can I manufacture it? How much is going to my PCB going to cost? How much is this? Most of them are ask, asking the same questions at like different stages in the life cycle. Our core offering clearly is for EMS. So of our 80-ish customers right now, most of them 90% yeah. are EMS or contract manufacturers, is I think in yep. the US. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Call it. Ah, it is EMS now, so I guess we're fine with EMS too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, and that is clearly our core. So most of also the processes in our software are tailored towards the typical processes within an EMS. But yeah, as I and kind of okay. as you alluded to, we also noticed actually an OEM asked the same questions and during an early stage in the design phase, they also want to know how much are all the get yeah. an early estimate. Yeah. So, so what you, you touched on it then, you know, what are those main issues that your core product is solving for manufacturers? Is, is a lot of that around that should cost kind of question? What should it cost? Yes. Yeah, so I think if you look at the process at a manufacturer, and that is the core of what we're offering, you can really think end to end. It starts with receiving a request for quotation mm -hmm. from one of their customers from an OEM, from a designer, and going all the way to answering that request yeah. for quotation with an actual quote, and actually going even a little bit beyond and being able to track shipments and, and like being able to yeah. offer like the whole service until the, the product is actually shipped. And so our solution starts, and that's something in the last year we've invested a lot of effort in um, with what we call the customer portal. So our, mm -hmm. our customer can offer to their customer the digital solution instead of sending an email in they can offer kind of powered by luminovo a website where mm -hmm. their customers can log in upload the bomb themselves and request a quotation and then looking from the perspective of the ems what that means for me if i'm working uh, in the quoting department at an ems is that at some point i'll get a notification an email where it's like hey look one of your customer a upload like requested a new rfq they already uploaded Bomb. they might have already added a bunch of comments in the bomb directly there and then you can go in look at the bomb from the other side and start your process of basically the the should cost and um, quoting the bomb but also the pcb as we discussed and um the assembly all the way to the actual overhead calculation of adding your margins at the end and kind of our i think goal is to make this process as easy as possible for you and automate as much as possible of it, though not necessarily every step needs to be automated and it depends a lot on is it a prototype, is it a serious calculation prototypes, you can be more back of the thumb and you, we can actually automate yeah. it. something we just recently yeah. shipped that you can go all the way end to end, upload a bomb, get an automated price for all the steps on PCB manufacturing, but then if you're doing serious calculation, there's going to be negotiations that you might want to do about the most expensive it's driving the costs and that's also something that that we support with sending out quote requests being able to import them back into the tool mm -hmm. and that's kind of yeah that's what i mean is this what from an ems perspective it's really the whole process from the very first touch point with the customer via a digital portal to sending out the quotation in the digital portal again uploading there 
sending out an email notification to the developer at the OEM that wants to get a price as quickly as possible yeah. um, to make a decision on where they're going to manufacture their product. Okay. So you use, you, you get, this is interesting actually. So the portal that the customer helps, do they then have visibility uh, Tim, uh, throughout the whole process then? Is that really, once they upload their bomb, they can see what's happening throughout the process? That's exactly the idea. I mean, there's often, and so that's something we invested a lot of time is being able to use, to import really messy customer bombs. Yeah. And we invested a lot of in uh, both a mix of kind of machine learning AI and rule-based systems mm -hmm. to automatically read out generic resistors and capacitors and as quickly as possible, get that bomb into what we call the digital twin mm -hmm. of the bomb. And the first step here is usually, I mean, we, and we do a lot of that, but sometimes there's mistakes. Sometimes it's unclear. Sometimes a part is out of stock. You need to get an approval yeah. for an alternative. So all of that can now be done in this kind of digital interface right. in the okay. digital portal that you don't need to send emails back and forth in different versions of the Excel bomb files, but you actually just talk in a tool. Hey, look, this thing here, what do you mean by that? Or this, this part is out of stock. How about this alternative that we've used in the past? Is that fine for you? And you have this mm -hmm. little thread and an audit log where you can also, that's something we recently heard um, again and again from some of our customers that that's really important to them too, is kind of making sure you know like who gave the approval when so that later if there's maybe a mistake, we knock on wood that there isn't, but if there right. is that you can kind of trace back to where that came from and where there was a mistake and who gave the wrong approval or chose yeah. the wrong part. Now, and <clears throat> the reason I ask is it just triggered it. I remember 20 years ago running an event in San Jose and there was an OEM in the audience and, and his comment then was, he says, what we want is a glass pipeline, right? From when we place all the way through to see yeah. everything, right? And it's and it's and it sounds like that you're working towards something like that, and it's uh, so that's why I asked the question. Maybe I could be more specific and actually answering your question, not just yeah. talking about related things. So yeah, as a, as a customer, you basically you upload it. Then there's the stage where there's a little bit of ping pong. Once all issues are resolved, you see how the mm -hmm. status changes to okay, the quotation is in progress. The guys are working on it. So you see that you could yeah. ping them again. But once they are done, they upload the quotation. You'll get another ping. Okay, quotation is here. You can go back and forth all the way to order confirmed and we haven't shipped that yet, but we're currently also working on kind of also tracking the shipments and the status of production after on that in the same portal, you can also see, okay, confirm my order and now manufacturing started. Now the thing's been shipped. Here's the tracking link. That's not live yet, but that's something we're working on right now. That's interesting. That's it. And again, from the customer's perspective, it's all via the portal then. So the customers in interact that way. Yeah, we have many of our customers um, that um, don't use that yet. It's usually a very strategic decision of the EMS whether to offer such a digital portal and kind of change their processes around allowing customers to upload the bomb themselves. And everyone that has adopted it so far, we've gotten really good feedback from their customers. So that's almost for that solution what we care the most about is so that the customers of our customers, if they are happy, that for them, it's a more pleasant experience, not having to wait two weeks without knowing what's going on until you receive your quote. And uh, we launched this, um, yeah, not uh, like half a year ago, I would say it was the first time that people took this customer digital portal in live production for their porting system. We've received lots of positive feedback in the two and a half years before that though, we didn't have that yet. And so we have a lot of customers still that haven't adopted yet that just use the tool on the back. And so they still get it via an email the bomb, get it in, and then they themselves, the person at the EMS will take that email, will take the Excel, import the bomb themselves, um, and do the same process more or less though. So yeah. um, it's kind of the same steps that, that, that we support with. Okay. Hey, tell me, where in the process, you know, <clears throat> having worked with EMS and OEMs in the past, I know that there's also, after the quoting, there's also which facility, uh, different plants within the same EMS, you know, have different loads and it might, an EMS may wish to place a particular order in one facility over the other. So that kind of managerial discretion issue, is that built in there or is that after the quote, then the EMS takes the output and makes the, uses that? You know what I mean? Um, yeah, no, I know what you mean. We've just, so we're, let's see, that's one of the 
things we're working on right now is to really get we're calling like enterprise ready with multi-site support we just added it in the manufacturing costing you now can add multiple yep. sites yeah and start with some of like have different formulas for your manufacturing costing base on different sites and start mm -hmm. making decisions and um, but we just this feature was shipped i think last week two weeks ago oh, okay and um, so we're in the process of adding more support also for kind of yeah more okay. bigger enterprise customers with multiple sites that need to make decisions where yeah, the sourcing preference are different based on yeah. where the uh, manufacturer, where your inventory is from. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. No, that's just my curiosity on that. You kind of triggered that. So talk about some of the types you've talked about some of them, but the types of issues that you're helping your customers resolve. You've talked about, you know, kind of the part side, but elaborate on that. Yeah. So I think one big one, and I think that's really where our solution um is really really good is this messy customer bomb part because that's kind of the beginning of all the other processes that we help with mm -hmm. is having a digital twin of the bomb because once you have that then you can automate the sourcing part you can automate manufacturing you can automate quote request workflows and so that's kind of step one just getting this really messy customer bomb into the digital twin format in kind of as fast as possible and we've seen like so many bombs over many many years now and we keep improving that process but then yeah the others i think the core is that's what we started with in the beginning the material costing so on one click you get over i think we have at this point around 30 apis to different distributors across the world on one click you get availability prices you get contract prices you can put in your own api keys okay. um, and on one click kind of see which parts drive the the cost of this bomb which parts drive the lead time and usually, I mean, it's a very, you probably know it's, it's very 80 20 or probably even more 95 5. And there's a 5% of the parts or these four critical things that you do want to investigate manually and then check again, maybe negotiate, maybe um, look into other sources that are not integrated via API so that you can uh, find availability at a broker or, or somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And I think this basically automating most of your work so you can spend kind of the brain power on the important part the one that really matter for you to win or lose this quote i yeah. think that's the core problem that we solve because yeah i mean 80 percent of the bomb is going to be some resistors that usually passives that you don't care about and if you, our tool can just tell you yeah look it's i mean it's available and it's here and yeah uh, it's cheap then you don't really need to worry about that and never even really look into it but just guiding that workflow and that's something that we in all of our softwares invest a lot of effort in our product and engineering teams is this whole topic of like usability workflows and many of the other tools in the industry are still very like excel based and we i mean try to stick to excel like interfaces when yeah. uh, that makes the most sense sometimes it does but there's many other parts where we just try to guide you to make it as easy as possible with as few clicks as possible to get to kind of the knowledge that you need to make those critical mm -hmm. five percent of decisions you, really yourself and letting the kind of yeah. AI or letting just the software system do um the core okay. and we could talk about pcbs for a long time that's just one area yeah. in itself well what, what we, about uh, also the issue of have of of the luminovo tools ability to integrate and work with with other existing tools that the 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 customer may have i'm thinking like erps as an example right? yeah yeah yeah, so almost any all of our customers have their ERP integrated. We offer um, both via REST APIs and webhooks. You can kind of go in both ways. So the REST API is for you to get data yeah. or to send it to us. So most of our customers integrate all of their like article numbers, the internal part numbers, and the inventory, some custom prices that they have. Mm -hmm. And the webhooks also work the other way around. So we have if there's an event in Luminovo, then the webhook can tell you about it and can be like, hey like someone requested a quotation or someone changed the status of this. And you can use kind of both of these toolboxes to build really complex automated workflows with your ERP um, if you want to. Okay. And that's also a topic that quite recently you invested more and more time that um, we have more APIs ready that not only can you imp import the internal part numbers and the inventory, but also all your customer part numbers and your supplier part numbers and your supplier contacts yeah. and have a really you know, tight, integration with your ERP system. Yeah. So as you as you introduce the tool to some EMS companies who may have started and still using Excel, right, where it's a whole new thing, um, 
Is there sensitivity still around the uh, how safe the data is? And do you have to do a lot of reassurance on some people or how is that? Um, yes, I mean, I think it's never been an issue to the degree that people then didn't trust us with data, but that's a conversation we have again and again. Also talking about customer portal. So our customers yeah. that now send that to their customers, the OEMs, they are often even more sensitive because it's their valuable IP that they yeah. are giving to someone they want to know this digital tool where I'm uploading it and what is it. And that's been a focus for us from the day one. You're asking me on a very good day. It's probably a little bit too early to announce, but we just today finished our audit, the stage two audit of our ISO certification. Okay. And it's probably, yeah, it's probably a little bit too early, but in like two weeks, there'll hopefully be a marketing post. Um, okay. around us getting the ISO 27K1 certification. That's something we invested a lot of time and effort into um, because yes, like we get those questions again and again. Fortunately, also without the certification, we were able to convince customers what we do and, and kind of all the efforts we put into securing yeah. the information that they entrust us with. But yeah, we actually now soon will also have the yeah. certification officially checked off. Yeah, no, because I know that that's still people are still sensitive, obviously, right? So they want to make sure that, and you know, they hear horror stories in the news sometimes. So they, I'm, I'm sure that, yeah. that 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 first yeah. question. So now, a couple last questions. I want to be respectful of your time, and I'm also aware that I'm the last thing standing between you and your weekend, probably. So, uh, <laughs> what do you? You, you've touched on a few things, and, and I, I like that because you, there's things always in progress there, it sounds like. You're continually developing and enhancing your tool. What do we have to look forward to from Luminova and the rest of 2023? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I already touched upon like is getting enterprise ready for us. So we're investing a lot of effort in multi-site support, even more APIs and webhooks so that you can have really tight workflow integrations with your ERP, with CRM software that you might have. Um, one topic that we haven't talked about so much yet is the topic of PCBs. So mm -hmm. I mentioned before that what we can do right now is automatically extract like price relevant parameters like um, the, the drills and the most smallest layer structures and obviously the width, width and the height and yeah. all of the things that you need to actually get a price from a PCB supplier. The next thing, so we already have that information. So the next logical step, and that's something we're hopefully shift within the next month, is the topic of web DFM, so that you actually not just well, get a price if you can, but really get feedback why when you cannot. So if there's some capability of the different PCB manufacturers that work with us, that you can automatically get that check and check and know, okay, what in my design, what design violation do I have so that this manufacturer cannot manufacture and I maybe need to go to the more expensive one. What would I need to change mm -hmm. um, to be able uh, to go with a cheaper PCB yeah. manufacturer? Um, we're investing a lot of time and effort, basically two out of our four teams around the topic of just part data quality um, mm -hmm. and basically doing what we can to improve everything from MPN aliases to just the lifecycle status, the compliance status, the, the package like what footprint does it have, uh, which is relevant for the manufacturing costing driver. So the more today of our customers still have to manually put it in because many parts have it, but some don't. And that's a topic where kind of, I think it's an, an evergreen. We've been doing that since months and years, but that's still a lot of our uh, efforts around getting better part data quality and connected to that one feature that I'm very excited about that will also, I think, be able to launch within the next three months. Uh, is the topic of bomb health monitoring. So we launched a health dashboard two, three months ago. So where you on one easy um, click can immediately see the health of your bomb in terms of life cycle, years to end of life, compliance. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of the next step for us now that you can actually just click a little button and say like, please monitor this so that you will send you automatic emails about when something goes from active to not recommended for new designs to obsolete okay. um, the compliance changes, or if we get new information from a new distributor about a part. Um, and then maybe the last one, and I could keep talking for more and more, what, what it is, <laughs> but the last one that I'm excited about um, is related to the topic of quote request workflow. So I thought we talked before a little bit about negotiating parts. Yep. If there's the one that's really expensive and you want to send out a quote request and we've already built um, a workflow around that where within our tool with just a few clicks you can send out to your supplier contacts 
post request, which will send an email mm -hmm. with an Excel attached. We talked for a long time with the distributors whether we should just send out a link where then they fill it in like some of the other tools do, but most of the distributors we talked to said, ah, we don't want to click on links and log in there and, and fill something out, but we prefer an Excel would be better. So we did that. And then a lot of our customers started using it. And then half of the time, they didn't send back an Excel sheet filled out with the prices that they negotiate, but actually a PDF. And a lot of our customers are really frustrated. They're like, well, now I have this PDF yeah. um, and I need to manually type things off yeah. of the PDF to get it into my ERP or into LumiQuote. Um, and we kind of ignored that for, I think, around like a year. And we're just like, sorry, like PDFs, they're difficult to work with. But then we've gotten it again and again and again. And uh, last month we started that project and we're pretty close to shipping it to building our own AI model. And that's kind of back to our roots. Um, and it was one project I was personally involved in actually to build an offer extractor that takes in a PDF and automatically, again, a mix of machine learning and rules can extract the unit price, the lead time, the MOQ, the MPQ, the MPNs, obviously. Um, and seeing if how much is in stock and kind of get that out there. So then you just need to quickly check through it, correct one or two things if they're wrong, and then click the import button and are able to also get those PDF prices into your Oh, account. excellent. 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 Now, you just mentioned the AI there again, and that's kind of where I wanted to, to, to end the interview with you, knowing that both... <laughs> You know, you and Sebastian both have that AI background, and he's spoken on, on with me on various times about it. I wanted to kind of get your opinion because, as, as you see, it's, it continues to get a lot of attention. It's a big marketing thing within EMS industry, right? Yeah. Now, right. All of a sudden, yeah. we, we, everybody's talking about that, and but at the same time, in the press, we see all these stories, right? So I think that it, it's seen either as a panacea for all the problems, or it's the end of the universe as we know it, right? So. And that even goes over, I was listening to a podcast recently, if you listen to somebody like a Michio Kaku, who's very kind of positive about it, to an Elon Musk who thinks it's it's a civilization killer, right? You know, and, mm -hmm. and I keep thinking, well, it has to do with what you do. There's generative AI, but then there's also what you're doing within the machine learning, which is, to me, it's, it's a different flavor. So you're an expert on this. Tell me, what's your opinion on all this, especially within the EMS industry? I was going to say, before we can do another podcast just about the general impacts of, of, of AI and, and what they do. And yeah, uh, our software engineers use it a lot now, Copilot from Git, uh, GitHub and ChatGPT yep. to just improve our own processes and developing the software. But within the context of the EMS industry, and I mean, we've been doing that kind of from day one at Luminovo, use it when it's, it makes sense. And it doesn't always make sense. Often you just build a rule-based system um, or just automations that aren't really... Um, AI for me, the place where it's most useful, I think, within the electronics industry is usually going from some kind of structured or unstructured data to a different type of structured data. So these are and these are the places where you use it. So it's messy bombs to clean bombs. It's kind of going from unstructured mm -hmm. to more structured. The last thing example I just gave you PDFs to getting it to a structured offer that you can import into an ERP system. And those mm -hmm. are the things where AI can be really good, better than just a rule-based system because if you it's just rule-based it can be brittle um, and and if you miss that one rule then then it won't work and then basically combining both usually gives you best of both worlds a little bit more robustness you get from the ai model but also the correctness mm -hmm. um, that rules give you so that's most of the this kind of going is that about the dis is that about the decision it, i mean there's decisions that have to be made throughout the process right and so I'm assuming AI does that to an extent, but then rules base is by definition kind of making a decision too, right? So exactly. How yeah. Do you, so how do you distinguish? Um, well, I guess with AI or machine learning, as you said, right, the way it works is you take a bunch of PDFs, you annotate it manually from the human to know like, this is what I would write out of the PDF. And then you train a model to like learn to predict what the human would put out. Right. That's good because it's often if you do it right, it gets more robust and it can take, you don't need to build a rule for every word that you've ever seen in the PDF, but it can actually um, predict in PDFs that it's never seen before. Um, and the disadvantage is that maybe it might be wrong. And that's where can, rules can really help because you can do sanity checks where you just know that a unit price cannot be negative. <laughs> um, yeah. And so you 
add a rule to kind of make sanity checks and guard the AI model and together and that's what we see in both in this bomb importing topic and the I guess PDF importing topic to work really, really well if you combine both of it, that you get a really robust system that still sometimes makes mistakes, which then need to be corrected by the human, but can automate much more than just an AI based model or just mm -hmm. Um, uh, a rule-based system. Could do. I could, if you want, I could give you a quick take just on this generative AI topic. I mean, that's been sure. all the news recently, ChatGPT and everything, because we also looked into that quite a bit. And I think I'm sure there will be use cases in the electronics industry and also in our software. One will be around like customer support, just if you have a really good <laughs> um, like help desk with lots of articles, these generate to like ChatGPT can make it much easier so that the customers can actually have a much friendlier interaction with yes. your help desk by using these chatbots in the end that have gotten so much better. But the problem, I guess, and this, this is where generative AI is really bad and which is really, really important in most processes in the electronics industry, so in many areas it won't be the panacea that solves any, anything, is correctness. And it's like in, in the EMS industry, it really matters if there's one letter different in the MPN, this is a different part. <laughs> That might be not fit onto uh, that PCB that you designed, and um, same for yeah, basically per technical parameters, and these very like basically one little letter or number that's different, yeah. and it has a completely different meaning in terms of your um, electronic circuit that you designed, and so that's where generative AI often isn't good in these little details being really accurate. It's more better with like language that's kind of fuzzy, and you kind of give something fuzzy back. And the guy can be really useful, but for many areas around, yeah, like generic parts, finding part alternatives, that's something we played around with for a while. And it's like, it can be like, you, I would recommend ask ChatGPT about giving you alternatives for some parts and can sometimes help. Sometimes it actually gives you interesting, good results, but often it'll just hallucinate something. It'll tell you, yeah, this is an alternative and the part doesn't even exist. And this kind of correctness around really knowing exactly or why is that an alternative and and does it actually exist <clears throat> yeah kind of validate data from the real world that's i think where yeah the, the generative approaches don't really shine and so all in all i think looking across the whole spectrum most of the things i would say by this new generative i think is rather unaffected though there's still many applications where i think um yeah as you said what you yeah. call machine learning the kind of techniques that have been around for a little bit longer and that have worked well yeah. um, can really help you automate parts of the parts of the process. Yeah. By the way, I love that term that within AI, the hallucination, right? The, that, that the system kind yeah. of hallucinates. That's, uh, <laughs> you that know, just, that shows <laughs> that it's not quite absolute, right? That uh, to, to your point. Yeah. So uh, um, <laughs> anyway. So uh, this has been excellent. You have been all that, uh, I'm, I'm glad to have had the opportunity. I've on, known you only by reputation, which has been very good and meeting you in person just reinforces that. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for your time and your insights today. Um, have you thought of anything nice to say about Sebastian? No, that's- I was gonna say, so if, if I mean, really he's just as smart as I am, but if he says that I'm the smart one, then Zeva is the charming one. Okay, oh, there we go. Okay, and he's a better- <laughs> And he's the better handball player, right? That is a, a guaranteed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> very good. Well, listen, thank you very much for your time. I would, uh, hopefully we, I get to speak to you again in the future because you're a great interview. Thanks a lot, Eric. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for the invite. Absolutely. Thank you.